Turn in your Bibles to the book of Matthew, chapter 21, verses 1 through 11. This story is in all four uh, of the Gospels. This is probably one of the most descriptive, but to get a full picture, you need to harmonize all of these Gospel texts to get all the details. And we're calling this the triumphant entry because that's what it was. In verse 1 it reads, And when they, they would be Jesus and his disciples, they drew nigh unto Jerusalem. They were come to Bethpage, unto the Mount of Olives. Then sent Jesus two disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you next door, and straightway you shall find a donkey and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them unto me. If any person says anything to you, Tell them the Lord hath need of them, and straightway, immediately, they will send them. All of this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, Behold, the king cometh unto thee, meek, and sitting upon a donkey, a colt, the fold of the donkey. And the disciples went, and did as Jesus commanded them, and brought the donkey and the colt, and put on them their clothes, and they sat Jesus there on Mark's account tells us that they sat Jesus on the coat. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way, and others cut down branches from trees. We read a little earlier where that was palm branches, hence Palm Sunday. And they spread them in the way. And the multitudes that went before and followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when Jesus was come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. And folks, when Jesus comes in to a service like this, or comes in to the atmosphere of a person's life, he stirs the heart and raises questions. Amen? Amen? All right, over the last five weeks, we've been following Jesus around. We've had the countdown to Calvary. This all started when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. He went up to the tomb where Lazarus had been dead for four days. He had been placed in that tomb, and he cried out, Lazarus comes forth, and Lazarus came out. This upset the religious leaders so much, they called an emergency meeting. And they said, we've got to do something with this guy. The whole world is going after them and their decision to put Jesus to death. So he wound up on the most wanted list. And when this happened, the scripture tells us that Jesus walked no more openly among the Jewish people. He went north, 15 miles north of Jerusalem. He hung out with his disciples several weeks. And then when Passover began to be closer, Jesus began to make his way back to Jerusalem. And as he came back, ten lepers met him. They cried out, Lord, have mercy upon us. And Jesus had mercy upon them and healed them. Then a rich young ruler who had everything came and fell before him and asked him the greatest of life's questions. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus spoke to him what he needed to do. And revealed that the thing that stood between him and God was his wealth. He had made a God out of his wealth and he needed to separate himself from that so he could lay hold of God. And the scripture tells us that he wouldn't do it. He was sad at that saying and he went away grieved because he was very rich. And then last week we had Jesus being anointed for burial by Mary of Bethany. It was a wonderful service. And we learned the great truth. We learned that Jesus was anointed to die so that you and I as believers might be anointed to live. Amen. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is the same spirit that lives within us if we're truly born again by the spirit of God. And he has anointed us, made us alive in his spirit. Jesus was anointed to die so that you and I might be anointed to live. We've been raised to walk in newness of life in Jesus Christ, says Romans 6, 4. It was a wonderful service, a great truth, reminding us that we are anointed to live for Him. Amen? Amen. 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 
Now your text tells you something very important in verse 1. And when Jesus and his disciples drew near Jerusalem, they were come to what? Bethpage. Bethpage. You see that? Got a little map out here on the table. I give this out every year. You can see what I've circled there, Bethpage. That is about a half a mile, maybe a little bit further, a half a mile from Jerusalem, from the Eastern Gate. Who is looking for him? The Sadducees, the high priest. They had given orders. The Pharisees had given a commandment that if anyone knew where Jesus was, report it and we will seize him. Not time to run now. Would they find him? Yes, they would find him. He would be discovered. But taking him would not be all that easy as they would find out. And what was their condition? Not on the feast day. Not on the feast day. What was God's purpose? Feast day. Feast day. So here is Jesus, just a half a mile outside the city, getting ready to make his grand entrance into the city of Jerusalem. What would it be like? What would he do? Let's take a look and see. First, I want you to see what I'm going to call that this triumphant entry was all about a plan foretold long ago. This is about a prophecy that was told many hundred years before. In verse 1 it says, Then sent Jesus two disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway you'll find a donkey and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them unto me. In verse 4 it says, And all of this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, behold, the king cometh unto thee, meek and sitting upon a donkey, a colt, or the, a colt, the foal of a donkey. So the disciples, two of them, went, and they found it just like Jesus said. When you read the other gospel accounts, you'll see that they went, they found a donkey, and the donkey's colt tied, and they untied them to go to Jesus. And somebody stopped them. It's like, where are you going to my animals? They said, Jesus has need of these. And they said, okay. So they went right on. So they brought the donkey and the colt to Jesus. In verse 4 says that all of this happened that a plan might be fulfilled. All of this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. That prophet was Zechariah. 500 years prior to this, he gave a prophecy saying that the king of Israel would come to them riding on a donkey's coat. Your Messiah will come riding on a coat into the city. This was not something that was secret. This was not something that would be done in the quarter. It would be a big deal, a grand entrance. So as Jesus made his way into the city... He was fulfilling the will of God. He was fulfilling the scriptures. And it was a plan foretold long ago. Do you often make plans about things? I know I do. Do you remember that story about the minister? The boy scout and the computer expert flying on a small plane. Do you remember that story? They're flying along and the little plane develops mechanical failure and engine trouble and all like that, and it's going to go down. And the pilot comes back and he says, I've got bad news. The plane's going down, but I've even got worse news than that. There's only three parachutes. And he says, I have to have one. I'm a young married man. I've got three small children. My family and my children have to have me. So he pops the side door out and away he goes. Well, while this was going on, the computer expert, he had, you know, made good time there. And he put, he grabbed one of the parachutes on, uh, on, and, and put it on. And then he said, I'm the smartest guy in the world. I am the best and the greatest computer expert. Work. The world needs me. The world needs me. And so he had one and he jumped out. 
And then the minister turned to the Boy Scout and he said, Son, I've lived a long, full life. I'm ready to go. I'll go down to the plane. You've got your whole life in front of you. You take this last parachute and put it on and go out. Everything's going to be okay. I've got this. And the Boy Scout was heard to say, Don't sweat it, Rev. The smartest man in the world just grabbed my school backpack and jumped out. <laughs> they got two parachutes left. So they was okay. Does your plans ever turn out like that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh the best laid plans. Sometimes we think we've got this thing by the tail. We got it all figured out. We feel so good about ourselves that we've figured things out. Only to discover later we've jumped out without a parachute. Are you living according to the ways of the Lord? Are you living according to His plan? You know, the Bible says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him. And He will direct your paths. Proverbs says there is a way that seemeth right unto a man or a woman, but in the end are the ways of death. I challenge you this morning as we enter into Passion Week, are you tracking after the Lord? Are you following His plan for your life? Have you allowed Him to enter into your being and save you and make you a new creation in Jesus Christ? This week is about a plan foretold long ago. This triumphant entry is about the will of God and the plan of God foretold long ago. And it's for you and me. Amen? Mm -hmm. Amen. But it's also a celebration fit for a king. Sister Debbie was trying to encourage us to worship him that way. To worship King Jesus today. To worship him and praise him for what he's done for us. In verse 6 it says, And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. And they brought the donkey and the colt and put their clothes on him. And they set Jesus thereon. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down palm branches from the trees. And they spread them in the way. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. I don't know if you know this or not, but to the Jewish people, the donkey was a symbol of peace. Jesus rode a symbol of peace into the city of Jerusalem. Yes, according to the prophecy. But he did so to make peace with men. Jesus is the one who made peace with God for us. In our sin and in our rebellion, we are literally enemies of God and His righteousness. But Jesus rode a symbol of peace into the city to make peace for us. The donkey was a favorite animal of Jewish monarchs. The horse was a symbol of war. And by the way, what is it Jesus is going to be riding when He comes back? A big white horse. And who's going to be coming with him on horses? <laughs> That'd be us. <laughs> Amen. But in this time, the donkey was a symbol of peace. And it, the other accounts tells us that Jesus rode this little donkey. Not just the donkey, but the little donkey. And if you look at the Greek words as it describes the donkey, the donkey happened to be untrained, unbroken. And yet that little donkey, untrained and unbroken as it was, surrendered to the King of Kings and the Lords of Lords as he brought him into the city. That's right. <clears throat> there is so much in this, and there are multitudes of people there. People from the three plus years of Jesus' ministry were there. The other accounts tells us that those people who saw Lazarus raised from the dead... <coughs> They were there. They wanted to see more of Jesus and they wanted to see Lazarus again because they couldn't believe it. They were telling people everywhere that they went. And remember, they've had several weeks between that happened when Jesus went north and now he's come back. That information has spread all over the place. And people want to see Lazarus who has been raised from the dead. They're coming out their ears, so to speak. 
There are people there who had ministered, had been ministered to by Jesus, who had experienced miracles. Remember the 5,000 that were fed? That's not counting the women and the children. That could have been 10, 12, 15,000 people. Many of those people were there. They wanted to see Jesus. They wanted to uh, be a part of this experience. And remember, it's Passover time. They were required to be there. This wasn't just optional. They had to be there for Passover. Unleavened bread. First fruits. That's just to get your attention to see if you're listening. Yes. It's there. All of these people were there. And what do they do? The text tells us that they shout and sing. These people are absolutely rocking for Jesus. They're so excited. Many of them had heard him out on the trail. Many of them had witnessed things. And this information is out there. He is not secretly coming into the city like he did on many occasions. He is coming in on Zachariah's prophetic, messianic cult. Hopefully many of them understood what this was all about. And they were excited. They were singing, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna to the, uh, to the son of David, which means save us now. Hosanna means save now. They were saying, save us, Lord. Save us. You are the son of David. Save us. Save us now. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And it was just absolutely overflowing with praise and thanksgiving and worship as Jesus made his way into the city. Truly, a celebration fit for a king. Did we give him a celebration fit for the king this morning? <coughs> Did your heart overflow with thanksgiving? Mm. Yes. A celebration fit for a king. No doubt it was a sight to behold. A sight to behold. They had never seen anything quite like this. A million plus people in and around the city. Wall to wall people. And as Jesus made his way into the city, whoo, they were waving the branches. They were putting their cloaks and their clothes down for the little donkey to walk on. There was a lot going on. Praise and thanksgiving and worship of Jesus. Celebration fit for a king. Have you ever heard that to, or seen that to show, Smarter Than a Fifth Grader? You ever seen that show, Smarter Than a Fifth Grader? Well, I got a different show for you this morning, Smarter Than a Donkey. <laughs> Are you and I, as his people, smarter than a donkey? In the words of Corey Ten Boom, she said, Do you think for one moment that that little donkey thought that all of that celebration and all of that fuss was for him. <laughs> you think that little donkey said to himself, boy, I must be handsome. <laughs> I must look good. I must be strong. I'm carrying in this person on me and I'm serving. I must be it. You think that little donkey thought for one moment that all of that celebration and all that fuss was for him. What do you think? No. no. Then why do we think that this upcoming week is about us? Why do we think it's about our pleasure? Why do we think it's about our vac vacation? Why do we think it's about our time off? Huh? What? Are we smart enough to understand what's going on? Are we smart as a, a little donkey? Mm -mm 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 -mm. That's a good reason why we need to be fasting. Because the world is going to celebrate this week their way. This week is all about springtime. The vernal equinox when it does its thing. It's about Easter sales. Merchandising. It's about Easter vacations. It's about Easter candy. 
It's about pleasurable things. The world has its own word for the season. It's a generic term that can mean any number of things. A good reason to fast during this season is so you keep your head, your spiritual head, and your spiritual focus. Mm -hmm. You should do a little study of the word Easter and see where that word comes from. It's kind of hard to pinpoint, but I'm going to tell you what, it did come from the scripture. No. It did come from the mm -hmm. Greek text of the Bible. No. The world has their way of doing things, and they're the world they're going to do it. Have you ever heard resurrection sales? <laughs> resurrection vacation. Resurrection candy. Resurrection eggs and bunnies. Resurrection bunnies? Those are symbols that don't have really anything to do with our season. They have a pagan origin, I'm sorry to say. Are we going to give him a celebration fit for a king? There's a reason why they call it what they call it. The biblical name of this season is resurrection or first fruits. And you could even throw Passover in there because Passover is a season that speaks of three feasts together. You say, well, I don't see it that way and I've Christianized those symbols. Well, I don't know about that. If, it's a, if he's worthy of our celebration, why don't we celebrate him in a way that's biblically appropriate and that honors him? When I say blessed resurrection to somebody, they don't know exactly what I mean. Amen. Exactly. Use that other word, it can mean a whole lot of things. That's why we don't use it around here. Because this is resurrection season. This is first fruit season. And we should give him a celebration that is fit for a king. Amen? Amen. All right, let's get on. It's also about a declaration from Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus of Nazareth in verse 10. And when Jesus was come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. And again, when Jesus comes in, he stirs the heart <laughs> and raises questions. There can be no doubt that the city was in an uproar with all of those people who were there. The word moved in your text is defined in Strong's word study as to rock, to vibrate sideways or to and fro. I often say they had the Elvis thing going on there, all shook up. They were trembling with excitement, agitate, caused to tremble, moved, to quake, to shake. They were literally rocking in that city. In that half a mile as Jesus made his way into the city and then passed in under the gate and into the city, these people were absolutely having a major party. They were so excited. So excited because Jesus is coming into their city on Zachariah's messianic cult, fulfilling the prophecy of God and presenting him and declaring himself to the nation. Many times he snuck into the city. He came in secretly, but not today, because today was Palm Sunday. A multitude of Passover worshipers there, million plus. And what were they doing there? They're getting ready to celebrate what? The Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits. Do you know what they do four days out from Passover? They are in the process of purifying themselves, getting their spiritual attention on, fasting, giving themselves to spiritual preparation. But the second thing that they were doing was selecting lambs for sacrifice. Four days prior to the Passover that began on Thursday evening at sundown, on first day of the week, they are selecting lambs. It is Lamb Selection Day. They're selecting a lamb to sacrifice for Passover. 
They put it up for four days. They feed it. They water it. They inspect it to see if it's worthy for sacrifice. It teaches them and their kids a horrific lesson that the innocent will die for the guilty. That innocent little precious lamb will die to cover their sins, its blood. They learn this horrific lesson that the innocent dies for the guilty. So on Lamb Selection Day, the first day of the week, Palm Sunday, while everybody's going about selecting their lambs, in comes Jesus riding on Zachariah's prophetic messianic coat, presenting himself to to the nation as the Lamb of God who had taken away the sin of the world. Hallelujah. He is declaring His divinity. divinity. He is declaring the spiritual purpose of God. Would they receive Him or will they reject Him? The story unfolds this week. Amen. That is the beginning of Passion Week. And as Jesus made His triumphant entry into the city... There is a declaration from him. The people are crying out, Who is this? Who is this? Who is this? And they say, It is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. He's the one that you've been hearing about. He's the one who raised Lazarus from the dead. He is the one that's on the Messianic Zacharias coats. Will you believe in him and receive him or will you reject him? Amen. Amen. There's a lot in this. Anybody know who that is? That's the famous W.C. Fields. Comedian, entertainer, uh, writer, actor. Very famous man in the 30s and the 40s. You could even get clips of him, black and white. Some of them have been color, colorized. But he was uh, famous in his day. Uh, he... What is not so famous is his thoughts about God. He was pretty much anti, anti-Jesus. He didn't live too long, about 66 years. And toward the end of his life, he was restricted pretty much to the bed and to his home. And one of his friends went in one day and found W.C. Fields, the great comedian, the person who's anti-God, looking and reading a Bible. We all sooner or later get around to that for the most part, don't we? Oh, yeah. Looking for the Bible. And his friend kind of laughed at him and said, well, don't you see what in the world would you do it? That, that's not who you are. What are you doing? And this is his response. Looking for loopholes, my good man. Looking for loopholes. That's pretty much says us, you know, that's our humanity. We're looking for loopholes. Looking for a way out. Well, the rich young ruler, when he told, was told what he needed to do, what did he do? He went away sad and grieved because he was very rich. See, everybody won't do it. Is there a loophole? Only one. Only one. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man goeth to heaven but by and through me. The only way that you and I can be forgiven and spend an eternity with God in Christ and His family is through surrendering our life unto Jesus. That is what this week, in the beginning of this week, is all about. Is God's Son coming to take our place on Good Friday and then be raised from the dead on great resurrection morning to validate his claim to be the Son of God and the Savior of the world. There are no other loopholes. It is only Jesus. And when he comes into a service like this and he's presented as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and he's presented as our Savior, it stirs the heart and it raises questions. Have you opened your heart in repentance and received him in, in faith as your Savior and as your Lord. Are you prepared this week to worship him and give him a celebration fit for a king? 
Let's bow before the Lord. Yeah.